they're our ancestors. They're beautiful to look at. We were supposed to be obliterated. They couldn't do it. And thank you, Edward, for showing all those old people too. Where his images um, actually do the most damage, it creates a false sense of who Indigenous people are that is still to this day applied to our appearances. Edward Curtis's masterwork, The North American Indian, an epic 40-volume comprehensive record detailing the individual history, culture, and languages of 84 Native tribes, was hailed in 1911 as the biggest literary undertaking since the publication of the King James Bible. His unprecedented magnum opus shaped American perspectives on Native Americans over the next century. Through his iconic images, Americans have been interpreting and misinterpreting Native Americans and debating whether his work has contributed to the preservation or the destruction of the understanding of Native American identity. Despite his triumph of creating a vital compendium of Native American culture, as well as thousands of evocative photographs that have even led to cultural revival, Edward Curtis's work perpetuated stereotypes while ignoring the tragic contemporary struggles of Native peoples. The photograph of Red Cloud, the legendary Oglala Sioux war chief, was taken in 1905 by Edward Sheriff Curtis, one of America's most prominent photographers. Born in 1868, it was the same year Red Cloud signed the Treaty of Laramie after his victory against the United States. The treaty gave the Sioux all the land west of the Missouri River in the Dakota Territory, including their sacred Black Hills. Over the years, the U.S. government reneged on promises made in the treaty, as it did on most other treaties. By the turn of the 20th century, Native Americans had been reduced to living on reservations on 2% of their historic lands in the name of westward expansion and manifest destiny. Between homesteaders, railroads, and gold rushes, only 237,000 natives were counted as opposed to an estimated 10 million before the Europeans arrived. The Treaty of Laramie also included provisions to build missionary schools and reservations and encouraged the Sioux to take up farming. After the military wars ended, a silent war continued, fought by the American government through the Religious Crimes Code of 1883 and the Dawes Act of 1887. These laws outlawed all native rituals, traditions, and languages, systematically destroyed tribal communities, and forcibly removed native children into missionary boarding schools. This forced assimilation was a cultural genocide. In 1904, the Seattle Times celebrated Curtis's triumph of having taken never-before-seen pictures of the Navajo Yebache dance. Curtis, a Caucasian American, had become a celebrity photographer of American high society, but was profoundly drawn to the spirituality of Native Americans. I had met ethnologists and archaeologists, but none of them seemed to come so close to the Indian as Curtis, so close that he seems a part of their life. Impassioned by the conventional understanding of his era, that Native peoples were vanishing, Curtis felt an urgency to document the intricate differences between tribes such as the Hopi, Navajo, Haida, or Sioux nations for posterity. Over 30 years, the Curtis team made 10,000 audio recordings of Native songs and history. In 1911, to rave reviews, his picture opera debuted at Carnegie Hall. In the Land of the Headhunters in 1914 was the first feature-length documentary of Native Americans. He was held by the press, a gem of motion picture art. It seemed Edward Curtis was destined for success. Despite his unparalleled achievement, from the perspective of some modern critics, Curtis's work is irredeemably linked to the highly racialized stereotype of the vanishing Indian. Curtis opened Portfolio One with this image of the Navajo, titled The Vanishing Race, and said, The Indians as a race are passing into the darkness of an unknown future. Social Darwinism permeated early 20th century white American thought and portrayed indigenous people as an inferior race frozen in time, for whom extinction was inevitable unless they assimilated into the superior white civilization. Curtis erased all sign of modernity, staged and dressed Native Americans as he imagined them, romanticized noble savages at one with nature. Many critics believe Curtis cemented these stereotypes with his iconic images, and that they misrepresent true Native identity, denying the tragic Native American past and reality. The romanticism was more about the fact that this was going to become their country, that the American Indian footprint would be gone. You would feel that they just kind of disappeared. You'd be able to have this image of them having their full set of cultural beliefs and traditions intact because the last time we saw them, they uh, were majestic and beautiful. 
so there never really was any suffering. So I think that that's one of the things that kind of makes Edward S. Curtis a difficult character to reconcile our, our uh, relationship with. Curtis spent many summers on reservations and witnessed the poverty and repression of Native Americans, yet he didn't document these issues. He photographed Geronimo, the legendary Apache leader at the infamous Carlisle Indian School, but not the children who had been taken from their parents with the aim to turn them into civilized Christians. Cutting their hair, adopting English names, and abandoning their native tongues were ingredients of this cultural genocide. Graves of young children by the school, undocumented by Curtis, are reminders of the tragic circumstances in these boarding schools. As much as he is being faulted for ignoring the tragic life of Native Americans, many share the opposing perspective, that at a time when the U.S. government wanted to eliminate all traces of Indianness, Curtis devoted his life to preserving it. And his passion to immortalize Native cultures resulted both in an artistic and ethnographic triumph. There won't be anything left of them in a few generations, and it's a tragedy, a national tragedy, he wrote in 1903. I want to make them live forever. I hear people criticizing me, carried around shirts, but he did a monumental job. And if he didn't come along and record this, the loss would be tremendous, incalculable loss. So when people start criticizing stereotypes, I look at my great-grandfather, He's not a stereotype. He can't stage that. You know, you can't stage the eyes and the determination. With a soft-focused lens, Curtis created powerful close-ups of indigenous faces to humanize them. Often taking pictures against the sun, the silhouettes of humans blended into nature, immortalizing the beauty of the American West. In 1906, when Curtis sought funding for the North American Indian from banker J.P. Morgan, he wrote, To further safeguard the patron of the work, I can ensure my life. Little did Curtis know he would disastrously underestimate the scope, time, and cost of the project. Between securing subscribers and working in the field, Curtis was hospitalized for exhaustion and mental breakdowns. His wife divorced him and he was forced to sell even the copyrights of his work. In 1928, 60-year-old Curtis set out on his last field trip to Alaska with one assistant and his daughter, Beth. This was 30 years after his first Alaskan trip on the lavish Harriman expedition. The contrast couldn't have been more stark. The 1899 Harriman expedition was a public spectacle followed by the international press. By 1928, however, the public had lost interest in Native Americans, and Curtis was a forgotten, penniless man, yet he finished the last volume of the North American Indian. He died in obscurity in 1952. I have never seen pictures relating to Indians which, combined with artistic feeling, can compare with these pictures by Curtis. What will they be a hundred years from now? Today, Curtis's photographs remain an American treasure and contribute to Native culture in unexpected ways. As a consequence of the Repatriation Act of 1990, in 2001, a totem pole from the Field Museum of Chicago was returned to the Tlingit Cape Fox community. Curtis's photos from the 1899 Harriman expedition established its provenance. Aside from proving origin, the images have established family heritage, ultimately contributing to cultural revival. For us, it was a cultural revitalization. We know our Clinket names. We can say who we are. My name is Kafla Kla. Because of this identifying those totem poles from the pictures that Edward Curtis took, we wouldn't be able to have done that today. It started an even better process for us to heal and that our people had still survived and are still here. However, to appreciate the long-term impact of Curtis's work, contemporary Native Americans must be permitted to define their culture on their own terms without comparisons to Curtis and create their own triumphant legacy. I hope that in another hundred years, his pictures will be a distant memory, replaced by new visions of indigenous identity created within our own communities. The North American Indian must be viewed within the context of Curtis's own racialized era. Curtis was an artist, and using props, reenactments, and staging photographs was the established norm in the early 20th century. His photographs must be seen alongside the vast ethnographic record that he collected over 30 years. Despite Curtis's work perpetuating stereotypes and ignoring the tragic struggles of Native Americans at the time, his triumph of creating iconic photographs, as well as documenting the heterogeneous culture of over 80 indigenous tribes, remains an unparalleled contribution to the preservation of Native American heritage. <laughs>